Okay, so today we're talking about writing equations in point slope form, but we got to review for the test first. Uh, reviewing is important because your brain will prune things off of your off your memories that it feels like you're not likely to use. And how does your brain decide whether or not you're likely to use it, whether or not you have used it? So in other words, if you learn something like a password two years ago for some obscure website and you haven't used it since, you think you're going to remember it when you get to that that screen? No, because your brain pruned it. Now, on the other thing, if on the other hand, if it's something that's really important that your brain knows that you're going to need uh, again, it's going to know that because you've used it so much, like your name. You're not going to forget that for a long time. That's why if somebody does forget their name, it's a sign of something really serious, you know, amnesia, uh, some trauma to the brain. So anyway. We're going to be uh, reviewing a little bit for what you should already know, but we're going to keep it fresh so that when you take that test tomorrow, you are as good as you can be. I don't expect you to be the best in the class, but I expect you to be the best you that you can be tomorrow. And uh, here's a little practice. This top one, I'm going to do this one just to remind you how I do it. First thought, fractions play nice with other fractions. i got to make these both into fractions. So that times that plus that. One times three is three, plus two is five thirds. You get that skill? Is that one a no-brainer for you, I hope? Good, yes sir. These two times, and then add to the top. All right, this one, this times this, four, add to the top, makes five over two. And now I still can't add them, because why? They don't have a common denominator. And if I had a common denominator, like six, then I could. So now I'm gonna times them both by two over two. Oh, wait, wait. This one will be 2 over 2. This one's 3 over 3. Because now they'll both have a denominator of 6. And this one makes 10, 6. And this one makes 15, 6. And then 10, 6 plus 15, 6. Notice I add the tops, but not the bottoms. Add the tops, 25 over the bottom does not get added, 6. 25, 6 could be written as 4 and 1 sixth, But this or this are both okay. Improper does not mean wrong. You can leave them bigger on top, and that's okay. All right. If you followed me on that one, then you should be able to do... You ready for this? Special effect? That one. Grab your pencil. Pencil's not moving. I'm scared. And some of you scare me. Reminds me of my I was playing ping pong with my son the other night. We have vicious ping pong battles. We're both very close. We shouldn't be because I've been playing for like 30 years and he's been playing for like five. But um, he's about your age. And uh, we have these just really good battles where you know each each point is going like four, five, six hits. And, and uh, if they're going, the ball's going really fast, that's kind of cool. But uh, he's like, man, I'm really sweating. And, and uh, as we're walking up the stairs and then he says, and then I said, uh, well, that's just a sign that you're healthy if you sweat, you know. And he goes, man, you must be really healthy then. <laughs> you got me. That was a good one. That was a good one. Okay. 4 times 2 is 8 plus 1 is 9 fourths. 5 times 5 is 25 plus 1 is 26 fifths. Can I add them yet? No. Don't have a common denominator. Multiply this one by 5s and multiply this one by 4s. And then I'll have 20s. And that'll be 45 20s plus, ooh, that's a big one, 108. Is that right? Thank you. Over 20. Learn 4 over 20. And then I add them together and I get 149 over 20. Raise your hand if you had that one right. Excellent. Okay. Next one I want to turn your attention to is this one. It's got a fraction added to a fraction on the top. And notice there's parentheses that are not shown, but they're really there. And then there's a fraction minus a fraction on the bottom. 
So then when you're all done with that, you'll have a fraction over a fraction. Remember how if it's a fraction over a fraction, you can change it to a multiply by the reciprocal? I'm going to take two seconds and bounce ahead a frame. That's like this one here. Remember how you can change that to times and then flip these two, five-fourths? Know what I'm talking about? All right, so back to this one. We need to first add these guys together and then subtract these two and then get a fraction on top and a fraction on the bottom and then flip them and multiply them. That is a typical problem for tomorrow. Give it a shot. See if you can handle it right now. I'm going to hit pause while you do that. All right, I'm sick of keeping this moving. I'm going to make this into fourths. It's going to be two fourths. And then I'll get five fourths over. This is going to be uh, two sixths. And one sixth minus two sixths will be negative one sixth. Ooh, that's nasty. I got a negative in there, but that's okay. Now I'm going to change it to five fourths times six over one, but it's negative. Don't forget that. And that makes 30 over 4, but it's negative. Don't forget that. And that makes it negative 15 over 2. Raise your hand if you had that one right. Good. If you didn't, I hope you know where your mistake was. Because if you know but you don't know, then that's a very powerful thing. Yes. Yes. And on this test, it's graded the normal way, so it's you are going to lose only partial credit for a dumb little mistake. But the downside is if you get 75% on the test, then you get a 75% on the test. And the Marzano grading, it's tougher on the little stuff. If you make a little mistake, it's just wrong. But you can get 75% wrong and still get an A. So it's kind of a trade-off. Most people end up liking the Marzano grading that we're going to do later in the year. They like it better. And one kid summed it up the best, I think, and he's like, 75% and I get an A. How can you go wrong with that? Like, so they're kind of harder questions, but you got to factor in that you can get some wrong and still get an A. All right. Back to this one. Am I recording still? No, I'm not. Yeah, I am recording. Okay. Anyway, assume that the black part was the problem, and the blue part was what the teacher did to try to solve it. Can you see this is that calc teacher's method of multiplying by something on top and something on the bottom? Because now that will cancel that. Yay. Down here, not everything will cancel. But when I take this times the first part, then the x will cancel. When I take this times the second part, then the x minus 5 would cancel. I'd like you to just simplify this one step. Not all the way. Just write what you have on the top of the fraction and write what it, you'd have on the bottom of the fraction if you multiplied as the teacher had applied it here in blue. I think I already told you, these two canceled, so the top's just 4x minus 3. That's it. So what's the bottom going to be? All right, when those x's cancel, I would have x minus 5 left on the first part, plus this part. And when I multiply that part, the x minus 5's cancel, and it's 2x times x is 2x squared. And that's it. Final answer, I'll just blow it up a little bigger here, is 4x minus 3 over, I'm going to write it in the right order, 2x squared plus x minus 5. And then the only other thing I should look for is see if there's anything that could factor on the top or on the bottom so that could cancel. It would be really sneaky if, like, this would factor and this would factor and then something cancels, but it doesn't, and so it won't. It's done. That's just a reminder of the Cal teacher method where you multiply on top and bottom by the common denominator. Let's use that again on this problem right here that I already wrote on. What would I multiply by if I want to multiply by the common denominator? What goes on the top and the bottom? 20. It's 5 and 4 are the two denominators, so 20 is the common denominator. 20 over 1. And then... Please do it that way and see what you get. A lot of canceling going on. 4 goes in here once, 4 goes in here 5 times, and then tops 15. I guarantee you that was faster than any calculator could do it. 5 goes in here once, 5 goes in here 4 times, 4 times 4 is 16. 15 sixteenths. So if you learn how to cancel, it's faster than any calculator. And besides, you can't use calculators tomorrow. So... 
All right, this guy, your choice. Either multiply it on the top and the bottom by something smart or flip it and multiply. Instead of making it a divide by five-sevenths, invert and multiply. Give it a shot. Do it one of those two ways. You already done? You're fast. Which way did you choose? I'm curious. So you did times 7 over 5, and that works great. Did anybody choose to multiply through by 21 on top and bottom? All right. A couple of you. All right. If you had multiplied by 21, the main thing is I want you to know how you can do it. I personally would have done in the, probably the same thing. But if I had multiplied by 21, here's what would have happened. 3 goes in here once. 3 goes in here 7 times. 14. 7 goes in here once. 7 goes in here 3 times. 21. Wait, 5 times 3? 15. 14 fifteenths. Either way works. I'm trying to give you options. All right, this is where that calc teacher's method of clearing the fraction comes in really handy on those two. I'm going to do the first one. I want you to do the second one in a minute. So here is the first one. I see a 3 in the denominator. I also see a 5 in the denominator. So what do you think I'm going to multiply by everywhere? 15. And if I times this by 15, and this by 15, and this by 15, I'll have my new answer, new problem, and it will be clear to fractions. 3 goes in here once, goes in there 5 times, 5 times 2 is 10n. 5 goes in there once, in there 3 times, 3n equals 30. See how it doesn't have fractions anymore and is therefore very easy? All right. Would you please do this one? Twenty four would be the number du jour. had to finish it, it would be 20n equals 24. And how do I finish finish? Divide by 20. n equals 24 divided by 20, which would be uh, 4 goes in there 6 times over 5. I think it's 6 fifths. Raise your hand if you got that too. Good. Any questions? Yes. Did you get six fifths first of all? Good. Yes. Sure. Yes, absolutely. One third n plus one half n equals one. That's a very smart way to do it. And then you times through by six. Awesome. Same answer though, right? Good. Okay, this one. Oh, we already did that, I think. Let's forget that. Moving on. Factoring. I looked up pictures on factoring, and the best I could do is the x factor. So, if I'm factoring this, x minus 5, x plus 5. Those have to be a no brainer for you. Just make sure you only do it when that is negative. Okay, if it's a plus, it won't work. So this one, go ahead and factor it. It's the same exact way. Take the square root of both parts, two sets of parentheses. Zip, zip, should be easy. Done already? OK, it started. Good question. Let's say that this had set a plus right here. Then, when I do this times this, I would not get positive 25. I'd get negative 25. And so you might say, well, can't you just use pluses then? Then, if I tried to do it with pluses, 
I'd get positive 25 at the end, but what about my outside and inside terms? They won't cancel anymore. See what I mean? So it only works when it's a minus. All right, back to this one. I hope you said 4x, 4x, 6, and 6, the plus, and the minus. But if you wrote that, you were really close, but you're wrong. You know something I don't that they don't know? Maybe? That's all right. I was hoping you had... There is something wrong with this, and I bet somebody knows. You do have to factor it farther, yes. Let me explain how I know this. Do you see that there's still a 2 in here, and there's still a 2 in here? I take the 2 out, and what would I have left? 2x plus 3. Do you see how there's still a 2 in here and a 2 in here? I take the 2 out, and I'd have what left? And then I could put those two 2's together and make it 4, and then 2x plus 3, and x minus 3. Did I? Oh, I did something wrong here. Hold on. 2x, 2 comes out, and I get 2x plus 3. All right, how about this? I don't like what I did at all because I keep coming back to what I should have done at the beginning is look for something that goes into both of them. Then we can do the little trick. What goes into both of them? Four does. Four comes out, and then I get 4x squared minus 9. Then I can split this up into two sets of parentheses. You get what I'm saying? Now I can do, what's the square root of this? 2x and 2x. What's the square root of 9? 3 and 3. And a plus and a minus. There's my final answer. All right, so the whole moral of the story there was you needed to get a 4 factored out of both parts. All right, I know I've been going pretty intense for a long time. I have one more. And then we're going to take a short break. If somebody can poke the kid who put his head down, that'd be good. All right, on the four-part factoring, I want to do one, and then I'm going to have you do one, and then we're taking a break. This part, when there's four parts, you need to split it up into two sets of two. You can't factor with four things in a row, but you can factor two things. What goes into both of these two? X squared, and what's left? X plus two. And you can factor this. That's easy. What comes out? 4, and what's left? Plus 2. And notice how they each have an x plus 2 in them. That can get factored out then. Just like if I have 2x plus 10, that's the same as 2x plus 5 times 2, or 2 times 5, and I can say, oh, they both have a 2 in them, so I'm going to pull it out front and put x plus 5. That's what factoring is, if it, both of them have one in there. Well, this is just factoring again, and they both have one of these in there, so it can come out to the front, x plus 2. And what's left after I yoink them out of there? x squared plus 4. And the whole point of factoring is so that when I am done, I could multiply this out and get that. If I actually multiply this out with first, outside, inside, last, I will get that. And the nice part about your test tomorrow is that on the factoring part, if you want to know you're right, you can know for sure. If you think you got it factored right, just multiply it out. And if it comes out to the original problem, then you must have did it right. Okay? So I'm just going to quick check this. First, I get x to the third. Yay. Outside. I get 4x. That's right there. Inside, I get 2 times x squared is 2x squared. That's right there. And all I have left is the 8. 4 times 2 is 8. Yay. All right. So you can always check your factoring problems. One last thing before we take a break is you try this one right here. Divide and conquer. Work for Alexander the Great. should work for you.
some of you guys that are better at social studies than me. Isn't he the guy that said divide and conquer? That's his strategy. I'm pretty sure he was the one who said Veni Vidi Vici. Which is, I came, I saw, I conquered. Pretty amazing if you think about it. If, if you have an empire that stretches over pretty much the entire known world. That'd be like one of the countries nowadays taking over every other country. Kind of impressive. Now, well, it's scary to think of a country needing to want to control the whole earth, but nonetheless, pretty uh, amazing general. And he would divide it in two parts. the other part and then this could come out and then what's left that and that raise your hand if you had that one right good all right let's take a break get up and talk to your friends for a little bit Take the record. There we go. Recording's working. We're back from our break. And one key skill. If you ever look at the numbers on a factoring problem like this next one right here, and you say, this is, this is just awful. The numbers are so obnoxiously big. It's probably because there's something that can get factored out right off the bat. In this case, six. And once six goes into all of those things, it becomes an easy problem. You just factor out the six, and then all the numbers are smaller and what easier. Don't do that one, though. Do this one. Oopsie. Do that one. Factor something out at the beginning. From there, it should be a piece of cake. Actually write this on the paper. Saying I'm doing it in my head is not good enough for me. Engage is a different part of your brain, actually. So does putting on lipstick, but it doesn't count. All right. So what, did, what uh, came out of both of them? Four. Two would also, but then you'd have to factor out a two again. So two, not a smart way to start. Four, good way to start. X squared minus 25. And wait, that's a difference of squares. So I can go four, X minus 5x plus 5. Raise your hand if you had that one right. Good. That's a little scary, though. That was only like five people. Let's try that again. Who got that one right? Okay, good. Now that's, that's more. That's more like... Oh, if you left it this way, it is not factored all the way. Because this can be factored farther. As in that part can break down to this. When you say, well, what do you mean by it's not done all the way? It's like this. Let's say I took 16 over 30, and I told you to reduce it. And you, Oh, wait. That's still 32. But it could reduce, but that wouldn't be a good example. 16 over 32 could say, well, uh, 4 goes into both of them. 4 over 8. There. I reduced it. But you didn't reduce it all the way. See what I mean? You can go another step. It was true what you wrote, but you can go again and say two goes in there twice, two goes in there four times. There, now I'm done. No, you're not. you got to go again. So you got to keep factoring until you're all the way done with the problem. Then you can stop. And then this problem, if you stopped here, you're not all the way done yet. All right. The last kind of factoring is normal factoring except... Hold on. Except... Uh, you have a number in the front that's not a one. So when you do this, all you got to remember is you go like 3x and x. Then you need to find something that will go here that will multiply to negative 2. Well, there isn't many choices. It's 2 times 1. It's just one of them's got to be negative. So it could be like this, 2 times 1, and then this one's negative, and I try it, and I see if it works. That's negative six, or no, negative three, and positive two makes negative one x, and that's not what I wanted in the middle. So that didn't work. I try again. 
I change the 2 to be over here. And I'll try plus 1 and minus 2 and see if that works. Positive 6. No, negative 6, sorry. Negative 6 and positive 1 makes negative 5x. Yay, that's the one then. There's my answer. All right, so there is a typical factoring problem. Would you please factor this one? Factor it in your head if you want, but write it on paper when you're done. So, Mr. S, give me an idea on how to start. Just to start. X and an X. That'll make my X squared. What else do I need in that first term? So, I should probably slap a 2 in there. A 2X and an X. Tell me what to think next. Okay. Did you get the right answer? Good. Uh, you didn't use 2x and x. What did you use? Okay. I believe you have a different way, but that's a, such a radically different way, I'm not going to do it right now because it might confuse people. All right. If I use 2x and x, I will get 2x squared. If I do the 12, I'm going to get 4 times 3, or 3 times 4, or 6 times 2, or 2 times 6, or 12 times 1, or 1 times 12. That's kind of a nasty one because there's so many different combos. Can you save me some time? You must have kept trying them. I mean, for example, let's say I'll go 4 and 3 and minus and plus, and I try it and see if it works. That's negative 6, that's positive 4, that doesn't add up to negative 5, so that doesn't work. you got to just keep trying them, it's just guess and check. Just keep slapping in numbers and checking the outside and the inside and see if they make that. You know what I mean? Alright, so cut to the chase. What was it anyway? 2x plus 3 and what? Okay, and now I know outside makes negative 8, inside makes positive 3, that makes negative 5 total, and the lasts make negative 12. All right, that's factoring. you got to be good at that for tomorrow and all year long. Seriously, top five skill you got to come into this class with is factoring. We're going to factor this and factor that and tons and tons of factoring. It's, not, it's something you can learn, but, man, if, you, if, it's, if it's, you don't have it, you better get it soon because you're going to need that one. All right, Dr. Frankenstein's monster was they sewed the head from this guy onto the body of that guy and right well if you've got a fraction that's got factoring in it sort of a frankensteinian sort of concept and that's the kind of stuff you're expected to do tomorrow so let's factor the top what do you get x plus five and x minus 5. And then on the bottom is an x minus 5, and that'll work nice because then those cancel, right? And let's do the bottom in green. What can factor out of that top thing? 4, and what do I got left? x plus 5 over 5. And there's nothing that cancels there, unfortunately. So now I have a fraction over a fraction, and that means this means divide. Do I like to divide fractions? No, I like to multiply them. So I go x plus 5 and multiply by, flip this over, and I'll have 5 over 4, parentheses, x plus 5. And then, look, cancels. One on top, one on bottom. Final answer, 5 fourths. 
The research shows that guys learn better in high contrast colors. So every now and then I'll be throwing in some high contrast colors like this. Because apparently it's easier for, not, not like you're going to be a genius if you use high contrast colors, but it, you know, it just helps a little bit. All right. Slope. Slope's definition is something over something. Rise over run. If I have a couple lines here, and I wanted to find the slope of them, would you agree that they look parallel? Would you agree then that the slope must be the same? All right. So if I went from here to here, rise one, run two, what's the slope then? Rise over run. If I rise one and I run two, what's the slope? One F, one over two. All right, if I was going to actually write the equation for the purple line, I'd say y equals, and I put the slope, x, and then I say the y-intercept. For the purple line, what's the y-intercept? Plus 9. There it is. There's the equation for the purple one. The red one would be the exact same thing, except it would say plus 6. Right? All right. There are three major forms of equations. Slope-intercept form, this kind like that. Standard form, like that. We've got the x first and then the y. And that doesn't tell you much. It doesn't tell you the, uh, the right slope or the y-intercept or anything. Um, this one's kind of lame. But this one we use a lot. If you have never seen that before, you better write it down because we're using it a lot. And it's one that you're supposed to already have learned last year. I know you learned it, whether you learned it for one day and then your brain pruned it out of existence because you haven't used it since. Or if you've never seen it before, you need to learn it now. So this is the slope. See how m is the same as that y equals mx plus b form? m is the slope. It's kind of like standard letter for slope. This is the point. Actually, I should do from underneath that, and that is the point. So if you give me a point and a slope, I can use point-slope form. So for instance, let's say I use the point, and I, I use this for a point, uh, 2 comma 7, and use a slope of 9. Then I would go y minus, and I'm going to leave room for my point right there. What's the y of my point? 7. Equals the slope, which is 9, times x minus, what's the x of my point? 2. There is the equation. And a lot of people think you have to solve it for y be, until you, like you're not done until you solve it for y, and that's not true. It's totally okay to leave it just like that. All right, so if you understood that, here's a point. Let's make it negative to add a little twist. And the slope, and I'd like you to write me the equation for that. It should be like a piece of cake. Like a whack-a-mole. What's the y of my point? So I put negative 4. Notice I said y minus negative 4. Now really, what does that turn into? Y plus 4. Equals m, which is what? 9. Oh, many times. Times x minus, what's the x of my point? There it is. Except I should really change that to plus. Do I have to solve it for y? No. Not unless they specifically say they want it in a different form. If they said we want it in slope-intercept form, this is not slope-intercept. So we'd have to solve it for y and multiply this all out. And then get this over here to the other side. And then that, that, that. You don't have to do that, though, unless they say to. Okay? Some people have that idea that it's not okay until it says y equals. It's not true. All right. What if they gave you a y-intercept and a slope? then I'd use slope-intercept form. That kind. What if they gave me slope at a point? Then I'd use point-slope, the kind I just showed you. 
And what if they give you two points? There is a formula for it, but I don't need you to memorize it because it's really long and complicated. But if they give you two points, aren't they also kind of telling you a slope? Yeah, because if they tell you two points, and I know one's here and one's here, I can figure out the slope. And then they're giving me a point and a slope, and I should use point slope, which is this one. X one. It's supposed to be a sub one, but it's a little tilty. It's bothering me. I'm going to fix it. X sub one. Okay. To find this slope between two points, let's say this is uh, 2 comma 8, and let's say this is uh, 10 comma 14. To find that slope, I could go how much rise is there and how much run is there and go rise over run. That works. If you want to do it that way, do it that way. Okay, how much rise is there? Well, it was up 8, and now it's up 14. So the difference between those two is 14 minus 8. Over the run, it was over 2. Now it's over 10. So the difference between those two is 10 minus 2. And so final answer is, let's see, 14 minus 8 would be like 10 minus 4, which would be 6. Over 10 minus 2 is 8. 6 eighths reduces to 3 fourths, and there's my slope. But, you know, I would have not done all that graphing stuff, and I would have just jumped right to this little thing that I know. And if you want to memorize it, I would do this. Oops. This tells you any slope. And I think at some point your teacher probably told you this, but if not, you can go back to the doing it with the picture. Y sub 2 minus Y sub 1, that minus that, over that minus that. And what do you know, comes out the exact same thing. So this little formula will tell you the slope of any two points. Now that I got the slope, they've given me a point and they've given me a slope. I use point slope. This one. And the slope I just figured out is 3 fourths. So 3 fourths is going to go in there. And which point do I use? Any point I want. I'll use that one. X is 2. Y is 8. Y minus 8 equals 3 fourths. X minus 2. So if they give you two points, they're really telling you the slope. So you should use point slope. All right. <coughs> you seen the free candy van before? I don't like that one. Anyway, ah, the y-intercepts. The y-intercept is where x equals 0, and the x-intercept is where y equals 0. I told my classes in higher algebra that like 5,000 times. I'm going to say it again. The y-intercept is where x equals 0. And now why do you really care? It's like, duh, the y-intercept's right there. I can see it. And that's the x-intercept. It's so easy. Well, what if you're looking at a big, nasty equation, and you want the y-intercept, and you don't have a graphing calculator to graph it? then you need a smarter way than just saying, well, I know where it looks like. You need to be able to say, the y-intercept is where, fill in the blank. Not where y equals 0. Oh, sorry, I said it wrong. It is where y equals 0. The x-intercept is where y equals 0. Sorry about that. And the y-intercept is where x equals 0. So it's always the other one has to equal 0. So if it's a y-intercept, it's where x is 0. And if it's the x-intercept, it's where y is 0. And I had it backwards in my head to start with. So, All right. Now, if I know that little saying, a problem like this one is a piece of cake. If I know what you want the x-intercept, I'm just going to stick in y is 0. And now I solve it for x. Now, this one happens to be kind of hard because it would involve some factoring, but the other one's going to be a lot easier. The y-intercept is where x is 0. So I put in a 0 here and a 0 here, and this all becomes 0, and this all becomes 0, and 0 minus 0 is 0. I'd have to just solve that. So I add 15 to both sides, and divide by 5, and get my y-intercept. Now, if you're looking for a y-intercept to be like a point, something comma something, repeat after me. The y-intercept is where x equals 0. So this is 0, comma 3. See what I mean? 
So if you need it in a point form like that, that's how you do it. All right. And I want you to see if you can set x equal to 0 and then set y equal to 0 and tell me what the x-intercept and the y-intercept are of that. We are almost done. The y-intercept is where x is 0, so I make that 0, and this would be negative 9 equals 6y. I just solve it. I guess I should simplify it a little bit. 3 goes in there 3 times, 3 goes in there twice. There we go. There's my y-intercept. And if you're a, a picky patty, y-intercepts are where x is 0. There it is in a point form. Okay, that's the y-intercept, where x was 0. Now I'm going to do the x-intercept. That's trickier. The x-intercept where y is 0. I make this 0. That's easy enough. 6 times 0 is 0. But how do I solve this? It's really not that hard. Add 9 to both sides. Square root of both sides. Don't forget plus or minus. Plus or minus 3. Why? Because if I stick in negative 3, it also works, doesn't it? Negative 3 squared makes 9. So how can I have two x-intercepts? Because this is a parabola. It looks like that. It has two x-intercepts. All right? Okay. So if you remember those little sayings, the x-intercept is where y is 0. The y-intercept is where x is 0. Now, the first test is tomorrow. I've covered everything that you need to know. If you've totally followed me, you're going to be fine. If you were lost at certain times, then you're going to need more practice. Uh, your assignment, which is for everybody, not just people who think they need more practice. Your assignment is right here. But the people who uh, are most concerned about the test should definitely be checking their answers on Schoology. Because if you do this whole thing, you might feel great about it and have half of it wrong. So do it. Check it on Schoology. If you totally understand it because you're like, yeah, I did them all right, and you have nothing to study. But your studying doesn't really start until you find out if you did any wrong. If you did some wrong, that's what you got to study. Okay? You don't study for this class by, like, memorizing the, you know, 100 presidents in a row or whatever. You study for this class by taking the time to check on Schoology, and if you don't understand it, work those problems out again. Am I still recording? Yes, I am. Yeah.